أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد كان في يوسف وإخوته آيات للسائلين رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته everybody today إن شاء الله I'm going to continue my uh, list of comparisons between the two profound stories, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam and the story of Musa alayhi salam. I've titled these for you so our comparisons remain a little bit organized and you can you know, come along with it. Uh, this set of comparisons today, I hope to do three of them uh, and the first of them is going to be between the siblings, which means the siblings of Yusuf alayhi salam compared with the siblings of Musa alayhi salam. So Musa alayhi salam famously has two siblings, his sister and his brother. Right, so the sister is the one that rescues him, meaning she follows along the basket until the basket ends up in the Egyptian palace. She waits outside until the the wet nurses come out because the queen told them uh, that she's the baby's refusing to drink anybody's milk. Allah said we had made haram the milk of any wet nurses for him from already from before. So part of Allah's plan was the baby would refuse to drink anyone else's milk. So the baby was going to starve to death. And so the queen, as in like an executive order, sent out these scouts and these wet nurses to look for somebody that can take care of this baby. And his sister was waiting outside. This is in the story of Musa salam. So we know about her, and we also know later on in his career, the relationship he had with Harun salam. On the flip side, you've got the brothers of Yusuf, who most of them were out to get him, and one of them was too young to understand any of what was happening, who later on became a support for Yusuf, or rather Yusuf salam became a support for him, uh, and his name is not mentioned in the Quran, but the Bible calls him Benjamin. Our Mufassirun used the Arabic version of that Binyamin. Okay, so, but we're essentially comparing, at least in the beginning part of the story, the two siblings, which means the brothers of Yusuf and the sister of Musa. That's the comparison for now. Okay, so let's get right into it. Uh, the reason the, the siblings are important is actually Allah Himself hints towards it. That's the ayah I recited to you in the beginning. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفَ وَإِخْوَتِهِ آيَاتٌ لِسَائِرِينَ And certainly in Yusuf and his siblings, there are many miraculous signs and lessons for those who seek, for those who ask. So Allah has given us Himself an important lesson, important lessons embedded inside of the siblings. So it's important that we pay attention to them. Anyhow, so let's start. Again, one side Yusuf, one side Musa alayhi salam. In both cases, brothers leave the house, but their intention is to get rid of their brother. But when the sister of Musa leaves the house, her intention is to actually retrieve her brother. So you've got this contrast of blood relatives, siblings in this case, one looking out to even ruin the family. In their mind, it's justified. They're doing a good thing, actually. And they've told themselves that dad's confused. Inna abana lafi dalalim mubin. Dad doesn't see things the way he should. And it's, they don't see anything wrong with what they're doing, actually. They've created a, a reality for themselves in which all of it seems convincing to them. And they've sold themselves. You know the American expression, they've drunk the Kool-Aid? That's what they've done. In fact, when their dad catches them, eventually he, he tells them, you're so delusional, you're so lost in your own thoughts and your own morality, where this kind of thing was justified to you. He says, بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَمْرًا You've made this convenient for yourselves. You've told yourselves a story that makes it okay. So you can have family like that. Sometimes they're doing the worst things to you, and in their head they're doing you a favor. And on the other hand, you've got the, the normal approach where a sister is putting her life on the line actually to go and try and save her brother, and that's the sister of Musa alayhi salam. So they both leave the home, one to get rid of the brother and the other to retrieve him. The brothers, of course, leave him in a well and abandon him. And the sister follows the basket, follows the basket, until she can't follow it anymore because the basket went all the way inside the palace. So she's outside the walls of the palace. But she doesn't say, well, oh well, I can just walk away now. That would make her something similar to the brothers who walked away. But she doesn't walk away. She just hangs around there to see what happens. And a few moments later, maybe an hour later, you've got wet nurses coming out of there looking for someone to take care of the child. And she's right there. So she didn't abandon her brother even when she couldn't see him. Even when she didn't know what's actually happened to him on the other side, she stuck around and she was there. So she refuses to abandon. Then the brothers cause, this is obvious now, the brothers are the ones that caused the separation in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. And the sister of Musa alayhi salam is the reason that they got reunited. 
She is the reason for the reunion. So Allah is showing us that even prophets are not immune from trial in the family. We can be blessed with family that becomes a cause for blessings in that family and saving and protecting that family. And sometimes our biggest troubles in life can be family. Right? The entire saga of Yusuf السلام, is actually dealing with a difficult family. And not, not to mention his own father is dealing with them. So speaking of the father, the brothers, they violate the trust of their dad. They convince him that they're going to look out for, for Yusuf alayhi salam. Inna lahu la nasihun, inna lahu la hafidhun. Two statements in the Quran. Certainly, we're gonna, we mean well for him. We're looking out for his good. And then they said, we, especially for him, who else than us? We're the ones that are going to protect him. They're very convincing. To, to earn the trust of their dad, and they violate that trust. And on the other hand, you've got the, the sister of Musa salam, who upholds the trust that mom gave him in very few words, just go and follow him. So it's interesting that in both stories, they've got a creative story that was told. In the case of Yusuf salam, the brothers came back with a shirt that had animal blood on it, bidamin kathibin, Quran says, you know, false blood, meaning animal blood. And they come with it and they show the father the shirt and say, you know, we Dhabna Nastabiq, we went to go racing. We left Yusuf with our food where the picnic was set up. We left him there. So the wolf ate him. Like uh, uh, their father said, I'm afraid the wolf will eat him. And now they say, oh, yeah, dad, I don't know how you got it. But yeah, he, he did. Look at the shirt. You know, and they, so they try to make up this creative story. But it doesn't stick. The dad sees right through it. On the other side, the sister of Musa, she's so smart. When she's outside the palace waiting, and those women come out looking for someone to take care of that baby, and she says, what's, the, what's going on inside? Well, we're looking for someone who can feed a baby. And she says, هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ يَكْفُلُونَهُ لَكُمْ وَهُمْ لَهُ نَاصِحُونَ Can I tell you of somebody who can take care of him for you? He could, they, I, I know some people that live in a house... There's a family, they're really good with babies. And they're going to take really good care of him. And it's interesting that the brothers of Yusuf said, Inna lahu la nasihun. We mean well for him. Nasihun was used. And when she talked to them, she said, I know a family, lahu la nasihun. Wahum lahu nasihun. And they're going to be good for him. They're going to take exact same words were used. But anyway, so the, the sister tells this creative story to them about her own family. She's actually talking about her own family. But she doesn't say, by the way, that's my brother. And that's like my mom, and she's really worried, so can she go back inside? She doesn't say that, she makes up a creative version. They're pretty good baby, babysitters, they're good caretakers. And that's how she gets the reunion to happen. So one is justifying the separation by way of a creative storytelling, and not telling the truth. And Musa's fa you know, sister is actually telling a creative story to help the family get reunited. And there's one important difference also. When she told her, her version of the story, she didn't lie, she just withheld the full story. I know a family that will take care of him is true. She just didn't say, it's my family. <laughs> right, it's my mom. She withheld information, but she didn't lie technically. So her creative story did not involve lying, theirs did. Then, you know, brothers, when, when the father expressed fear, that I, don't, I can't let him go, I'm, I'm really, it worries me that you're going to take him away. And I'm afraid that the wolf will eat him when you're just not paying attention to him. Well, they talk back to him and they, they start telling him, what are you talking about? How can a wolf eat him when we're around? And they're having this argument with him. On the other hand, Musa's sister, it's, it's kind of flipped because in Yusuf's case, the dad didn't want to let the baby go, right, with them. Or the, or the baby brother. Now, he's not really a baby, he's a young boy. He didn't want to let, let him go. And they convinced him. On the other side, Musa was convinced by, Musa's mother was convinced by Allah. She put the baby in the basket. And now she's telling the sister to go after him. But when she tells him, she doesn't talk back. Mom, what do you want me to do? It's in the water. What do you want me to swim? What do you mean follow him? And you know what's interesting about the word qassa? Qassa in Arabic means to follow step by step. And the mom said to this girl, she said, qusihi, follow him step by step. And the girl could have given a smart answer. A lot of you parents, you get smart answers from your, parent, from your kids. When you say, follow him, actually mom, you can't follow someone in the river step by step because like, you can't step in water. So do you mean like swim after him? Because these are new clothes, I just got them for eat. <laughs> she doesn't talk back. 
She understands mom's desperate, so the words that came out of the mom weren't just the right exact words. She said, follow him step by step, which is physically impossible. But what she means is don't lose sight of him. So instead of taking the time to give mom a smart answer or to correct her and do any of that stuff, she just quietly just does it. And then the Quran describes that she walked along the bank of the river and she kept the side on, on the baby. And making sure the soldiers don't realize what she's doing. And she did all of that without the mom telling her, right? And I, I talked to you guys about, about this before. In other words, here you have brothers that are talking back to their dad. You have a girl who even when the mom said the wrong word, she actually said the wrong word out of desperation. That's how the Quran captures it. She understood what mom's saying and got the job done. And that's how children need to be with their parents. Children need to understand sometimes when parents are saying something that you don't pick at the faults of what they said. Just understand the point that they're making and stop nitpicking and start trying to play smart. Start trying to be, stop trying to be sarcastic. That's not becoming of a child. So, you know, they, they obey quietly. Now, or she obeys quietly. Now another comparison. Brothers have no clue what's coming. What do I mean by this? When, she, when he was put in the well, Allah told him, لَتُنَبِّ أَنَّهُمْ بِأَمْرِهِمْ هَذَا You are going to be telling them about this, what they've done to you when they're putting you in a well. وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ And they have no clue that's coming. They have no clue that they've set themselves up for that embarrassing situation that will happen years later. They have no idea. Allah already knows. And Allah has already told Yusuf السلام, that they have no idea. Okay. Similar, so the words are, وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ They have no clue. And they, so they have no, the one they schemed against, they have no clue that this scheme is going to backfire and they're actually going to be on the receiving end of it. They're the ones that are going to be humiliated. That's what's going to happen. On the other side, exactly the same wording. When the baby, the basket comes into the palace and the Pharaoh finally agrees to keep the baby and adopt the child, when that happens, Allah says that, he, the, he, you know, لِيَكُونَ لَهُمْ عَدُوًّا وَحَزَنًا and they, so that they can, he, so Musa alayhi salam could be an enemy to them, and he could be a source of grief to them, and they had no idea, وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ They have no idea who they've just picked up. They have no clue that the fall of the, the mighty Egyptian empire is coming because of the baby they just picked up. Their plan to kill all those kids, to avoid that from happening, is going to backfire, and the nuclear weapon that's going to deliver that destruction is the one they're raising in their own palace. That's the one, that, and they have no idea. They have no clue. So they've got the brothers of Yusuf who have no clue. وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ And Pharaoh, in, you know, إِنَّا wa wa كَانُوا خَاطِئِينَ They were making a huge mistake because they have no idea. They have no idea what they've done by taking in Musa alayhi salam and raising him because the, the, the wheels are now in motion. The plan of Allah is in motion. What this teaches us is that sometimes people scheme against you and you're helpless against their schemes. Because in both cases, the one that's being schemed against is a child or a baby. Right? They're helpless against that scheme. And they think, what is this child going to do in fate, you know, or what is this helpless person going to do in response to my scheme? We've thought it through. فَأَجْمَعُوا بَيْنَهُمْ you know, Amrahum Bainam. They they unified, they discussed and came to a consensus about how we're gonna deal with this problem. What is a defenseless child against the scheme of his overpowering brothers? What's the defense of a baby against the mightiest empire on earth? But Allah says they have no idea that there's someone planning on those innocents' behalf and on behalf of those people that are apparently powerless, you know, Wanuridu and Numakina Lahum fil Ard. Nuridu and Namunna Ladina Sudrifu fil Ard. Allah says, we wanted to give favor to those who were made weak in the land. Meaning Allah has a plan for the weak. Sometimes the, 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 cult, the perpetrators, the aggressors, they have plans. And they execute those plans. But Allah has a plan that they can't counter. They have no idea how to counter it. You know? And so, them putting him in a well, they didn't know they're putting the next minister of finance for Egypt in a well. That they're going to be coming to begging for food. They don't know that, but Allah does. وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ And Allah already told the child, you're going to be telling them about this one day. لَتُنَبِّئَنَّهُمْ بِأَمْرِهِمْ هَذَا Let's move along. Brothers are told, this is kind of a, a light comparison. Uh, uh, Yusuf salam's father, Yaqub, later on in the story, he was you know, worried that his children are not going to be careful when they go back to Egypt to retrieve their second brother, Binyamin. 
Uh, and if you guys aren't familiar with that, that part of the story, just be patient with me. When we get to that part of the story, it'll become clear. But the point I wanted to make in comparison is, he gave instruction to his children to go carefully and not all enter through one gate, making themselves obvious. Okay, so go through different gates and don't make yourselves look like a consp inconspicuous kind of a, a suspicious group. That's why, who, who are these people all together? Right, don't call attention to yourselves. And it's similar that the sister of Musa as I mentioned, she went out looking for her brother, but she didn't make herself obvious. She was kind of inconspicuous and she was, uh, you know, not calling attention to herself when she was doing so. Musa alayhi salam story is also different from Yusuf alayhi salam story because Yusuf alayhi salam years later carries the, the scar and really the, you know, the grudge even what his brothers had done to him, the hurt he has inside him. How could his own brothers do that to him? And years later when he did see them, they didn't recognize him. And when they didn't recognize him, and he tried to keep his younger brother with him through that scheme, you know what they said? Oh, if bin Yamin stole... You know, he used to have a brother, he was a thief too. So they don't even feel bad about what they did to Yusuf. They're still bad-mouthing Yusuf, lying about him, calling him a thief. So he carries a very ill opinion of his brothers because of the scars they've dealt him early on in his life and even later on without them knowing that they're doing so. On the flip side, Musa alayhi salam, when Allah talks to him, he has a high opinion of his brother. Huwa afsahu minni lisanan. He's a way better speaker than I am. Ushdud bihi azri wa ashrikhu fi amri. You know, Harun, my brother, give, fortify my back with him and make him a partner in my mission. So he speaks highly of his brother while Yusuf alayhi salam has to withhold the, the ill opinions he has of his brother and has to swallow a lot of sadness that comes later on in the story. Okay, so that was a little bit about the comparison of the two siblings. Let's talk about the journey. This gets really interesting. What do I mean by the journey? The journey of the children. So Yusuf is journeying from his home to the well, to being sold into slavery, to end up in Egypt, right? And Musa alayhi salam is leaving his home in a basket, and he's going to end up in the palace in Egypt. So these two journeys are what we're talking about now, okay? Uh, so the first one, Yusuf is dropped in a well where he is at risk of drowning. Musa is dropped in a river where he's in risk of drowning. But one is dropped in standing water and the other is dropped in flowing water, right? Now that's important because if you're in standing water, you ain't going nowhere. You're in a well. But if you're in flowing water, you're in motion, right? So that leads me to the next comparison. Someone will come to Yusuf, right? Some caravan will come to him and they'll retrieve him. And on the flip side, Musa alayhi salam will come to them. He's the, the basket is coming to the palace. So he's being delivered to the ones that will retrieve him on, from the other side. And then, iltaqata, which is the word for, there are many words for retrieving in Arabic, but to come upon something, the word is iltaqata. And iltaqata is used in Surah Yusuf when they retrieved him. فَالْتَقَطَهُ بَعْضُ sayyara. And on the other side, فَالْتَقَطَهُ alu fir'aun. The, the family of the Pharaoh retrieved Musa, exact same word is used. Iltiqat, iltiqat on both sides. Then Yusuf alayhi salam ends up in an Egyptian palace because he got sold into slavery and they hid him and then they quickly sold him off, which is a story by itself. Why did they sell him off so quickly? وَكَانُوا فِيهِ مِنَ الزَّاهِدِينَ And they were pretty, uh, pretty, pretty cheap. They weren't very materialistic when they wanted to quickly sell him off. And he ends up in a, you know, a palace in Egypt because a minister bought him, right? So he's in royalty basically, he's living in a royal home in Egypt. And on the flip side, Musa a.s. ends up also in an Egyptian palace. So they're both ending up in an Egyptian palace. Then, it's contrasted, Yusuf a.s. was retrieved by an influential man, the minister, Al-Aziz. And Musa a.s. is carried by an influential woman, the wife of the Pharaoh. So both of them have influential places in society, but one's the male, one's the female. Now, they're both married also, right? So the man is married, and the wife of the Pharaoh, obviously married to the Pharaoh. So the husband, meaning the minister, instructs his wife to keep him. So he brings Yusuf home and says to her, Akribi mathwahu, honor his residence, meaning give him a good respectable housing. Don't just keep him as a servant that you disrespect. Give him decent housing, he, this is a special kind of child. So obviously you don't just buy a servant 
and just come home, there's a journey. And on that journey, he got to know this kid, interacted with him and realized this is a special child. Special enough that when he brought him to the wife, he said, maybe we could even adopt him as our own son. Like that's how special Yusuf was to him. So at the very least, he said, until we decide what to do, make sure you give him respectable housing. Akrimi mathwahu. But anyway, he instructs his wife to do this. On the flip side, the wife of the Pharaoh is not in a position to instruct. Right? She can't, she can't tell. So what does she do? She requests the husband to keep him. You know, لا تقتلوه. She comes to him and says, don't kill him, please. Could you not kill him? Which brings me to the next comparison. Yusuf's, you know, the, the caregiver, the minister, offered two options to his wife. And Musa's caregiver, the queen, offered two options to her husband, the pharaoh. And in both cases, pay attention to this now, in both cases, the villain is being given two options. Because the villain in Yusuf's story is the lady of the house. And the villain in Musa's story is the man of the house. And they're being given two options. What are the two options? Asa an yanfa'ana aw nattakhidahu walada. Exactly the same words in Surah Yusuf and Surah Al-Qasas. Maybe he will benefit us, meaning he could be of service to us, we can keep him as a servant. Or we can take him as our own adopted child. So, I've written here, service or adoption, right? Those are the two options. And the minister gives his wife two options, maybe we'll, maybe we'll keep him as a servant or as an adopted child. The Pharaoh's wife comes to him and says, don't kill him, maybe he could be a servant or even an adopted child. Both options. And in the case of the minister, interestingly enough, the service option is used, meaning he's kept at, as a servant. And in the case of Fir'aun, the prince, he's adopted as their own. Alam nurabbika fina walida. I found this really interesting because it's kind of unexpected. You see, the minister is clearly impressed with this boy. So you would expect that the option taken would have been that he'll take him as his own adopted child. On the flip side, the Pharaoh can't stand Israelites. He's killing their babies. So even if he tolerates saving one of them, not killing him, the most he might be willing to do is keep him as a servant. What I'm getting at is, in the case of Yusuf, the expected decision seemed to be adoption. And in the case of Musa, the expected decision seemed to be service. But it's flipped. The decision in the case of Yusuf is he's turned a servant. And the decision in the case of Musa is he's actually adopted. Things don't turn out as we expect. You know? And so now both stories are going to take place inside an Egyptian palace. And one of them is going to be of service and the other going to be of royalty. Meaning Musa is going to be raised a prince. Then we talk about love a little bit. When it comes to Yusuf salam, the wife of the minister has love for him. I'm going to stop for a second. What's going on? Oh, my car keys, they're not with me. Sorry. Because that was, was way too distracting, so sorry. Okay. It's okay. Hi, internet, I get distracted sometimes. I'm going to go back to work now. Okay. So, Yusuf alayhi salam, his keeper, meaning the wife of the minister, she has love for him, but it's a misguided kind of love. She's a married woman who's got a crush on this servant of hers. So she's got this confusing, toxic kind of love for, for Yusuf alayhi salam. On the other hand, the villain is not a woman, the, the villain is a man, it's Fir'aun. But Fir'aun also had love for Musa alayhi salam, but his love was not a toxic kind of love. In fact, Fir'aun hated all the Israelite children, but Allah says, you know, um, in, in Surah Taha, Allah says, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِّنِّي He tells Musa alayhi salam, I, I dropped a special kind of love on you. Meaning, the Pharaoh couldn't even help himself. He was divinely, Allah divinely intervened into his heart and put a love of Musa in him. What I'm contrasting is, she, in the story of Yusuf, has a misguided love for Yusuf. But Fir'aun actually has a divinely inspired love for Musa. It's actually that love that kept him from killing him all those years. It's the same love that even when Musa came back and gave Egypt all kinds of trouble, for all those years, the Pharaoh refused to kill him until the very end. 
That's finally when he broke the final straw. But he wouldn't kill him until then. Now, because of that love, the toxic love, and the love not just that the minister's wife had, but the women around him had, because of that love, the Yusuf alayhi salam was threatened to be put in jail. Actually, the second time he met and those women cut their hands, those of you that are familiar with the story, she literally said, if he doesn't do what I want, la yusjananna, he will get thrown in jail. He will get thrown in jail. Later on you find Musa alayhi salam, you know, challenging Fir'aun. And Fir'aun says, لَإِنِ اتَّخَذْتَ إِلَهًا غَيْرِي لَأَجْعَلَنَّكَ مِنَ الْمَشْجُونِينَ If you dare take a god other than me, I will make sure you are from those that are thrown in jail. Both stories include a threat for being thrown in jail. And the one that, the, the villain is the one making the threat. Follow my way and you won't go to jail. It's interesting also that one wants you to disobey Allah and the other wants you to disbelieve in Allah. In other words, one wants you to take an action against Allah. Zina. And the other wants you to take, a, take the belief of Allah out of your heart. Right? So one's an internal, one's calling Allah's, dis, Allah's disobedience inside the heart. And the other in actions. And you know what? Our faith is both things. It's what we have in our hearts and it's also our threatened unless they take action against Allah. And the other is being threatened unless they change their belief in their heart about Allah. SubhanAllah. This is showing us that Iman is both of those things. It is word and action. This is why in the Quran, it's interesting that one of the words for the prayer, the five prayers we have, one of the prayer, one of, one of the words for prayer is iman. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِالنَّاسِ لَرَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمِ Allah would never be one to waste your iman. It's a side note, but an important one because of this comparison. You know, the Muslims used to pray towards Jerusalem until the qibla changed and we prayed towards Kaaba. When we prayed towards Kaaba, the Jewish community of Medina told the Muslims, "Hey, so all your other prayers, you all got the wrong address. Those didn't count, huh?" And the Muslims started wondering, were we praying in the wrong direction? Did those prayers not count? And Allah revealed, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ Allah would not be one to waste. You would expect Allah to say, Allah would not be one to waste your prayers. He didn't say that. He said, Allah would not be one to waste your iman. What's, why did Allah say that? Because to Allah, your prayers are actually your iman. So He equated prayer with faith. He put them together. In another place in Surah Al-Qiyamah, he says, فَلَا صَدَّقَ وَلَا صَلَّى He didn't confirm the truth, nor did he pray. To Allah, confirming the truth comes directly with what? Prayer. There are one, two sides of the same coin. What is happening here? Two sides of the same coin. Action, that is in obedience to Allah, and faith, that is in subservience to Allah. And you are in a situation sometimes, where you have to renounce obedience to Allah. You're being threatened by society. You're being pressured to disobey Allah. And if you don't, there will be consequences. You, you, on the other hand, you might have to renounce your whole identity as a Muslim, like Musa alayhi salam. So there are both kinds of pressures that people can be put under, where their life can be made miserable. Fir'aun is making a threat, the wife of the Pharaoh is making a threat. And sometimes those threats succeed. In the case of Yusuf, it succeeded. She, he was thrown in jail. In the case of Musa, it didn't succeed. But regardless, the real threat is still there, right? So we have to be aware that these threats can come. And sometimes these threats come from people who are supposed to be our caregivers. Who are supp- and she was told from the very beginning, what? Honor his residence, right? And this is how she's honoring his residence? And Pharaoh raised him as his own child. What are we learning? Sometimes even people close to us not just fam- people from the outside, people close to us might threaten our loyalty to Allah. They might use love as an excuse, because the Pharaoh used love. He said, I raised you, you're going to disobey me? I did everything for you? You've been here since you were a child? And you're going to stand out against me? So he's using emotional manipulation. I'm remembering the Sahabi Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas anhu, whose mother basically blackmailed him, emotionally blackmailed If you love me, you'll leave Islam. Right? So, that, you know, it's either our actions that are going to be called, like it's okay, disobey Allah because you love me. And on the other, you know, you better disobey Allah and you're going to be threatened, disbelieve in Allah if you fear me. So both of those threats are being uh, contrasted. It's interesting in both cases, to have love for them. 
قَدْ شَغَفَهَا حُبَّا the, the, the women said about him, about her, she's just obsessed in love with him. She, and she's in love with him and trying to destroy him. Well, you, this is what you call toxic love. I love you, that's why I'm trying to kill you. I love you, that's why I'm trying to throw you into jail. You don't understand my love, it's complicated. <laughs> right? Your love is ruining your, somebody's life, but it's love. And nobody will love you like I do. Thank God for that. <laughs> you know? And on the other hand, you've got Firaun who loves Musa alayhi salam. And yet he's doing the acts of aggression that he's doing. So in- interesting in the way that they were raised. Yusuf alayhi salam was raised. He, early on he had exposure to his dad, right? But then now he's in an Egyptian palace, a completely non-Muslim environment. And he's a servant, which means he has no parental role. The masters will tell you where to get the groceries or what room to clean or what animal to, to, you know, to, to take care of or feed or whatever. That's what they'll tell you. They're not going to give you an education. They're not going to give you like mentorship and guide you. And how can they? They're not even believers themselves. They're, they're not even believers themselves. So Yusuf salam is raised without a spiritual mentor. He only has the memory of his spiritual mentor, which is his father, a prophet, Yaqub salam. On the flip side, from birth, from early on, Yusuf alayh, Musa alayhi salam has two spiritual mentors. His birth mother, who was reunited with him, clearly she's a woman of faith. Quran describes the strength of is raising him. And then he's got Asiya, his adopting mother, who's also one of the most amazing believers that ever lived. Right? So he's got that mentorship from, from both of those moms that are raising him even though he's in a negative environment. What's interesting later on in the story of Musa alayhi salam is as he was escaping Egypt, he said, Rabbi najini min al qawm al He said, Master, rescue me from the wrongdoing people. The exact words are, najini min al qawm al Rescue me from the wrongdoing people, Surah Al-Shu'ara. And in Surah Al-Tahreem you find the wife of the Pharaoh made dua and said, to rescue her from the Pharaoh, Najini min Fir'auna wa Amalihi wa Najini min al qawmid Walimin. Rescue me from the wrongdoing people. She made the exact same dua as Musa alayhi salam. What does that tell you? She's the mother figure for Musa alayhi salam. If she's making that dua, he's probably learned that dua from her. And he's exactly making that dua as he's trying to escape Egypt that his mother's been make- making to escape Egypt herself. But she can't because she's the queen, she's stuck there. You know? So, Rabbi Najini min al qawmid dhalimeen. Now we get to the test. Now things get intense a little bit. The young men are tested. Now, what do I mean by that? Young men are tested. Musa turns into a young man. Yusuf turns into a young man. Actually, Yusuf early on. Yusuf turns into a young man. Generations later, Musa turns into a young man. The first thing to note here is how does Allah describe them becoming young men? The, there's an ayah in Surah Yusuf about that, obviously about Yusuf. There's an ayah in Surah Al-Qasas about Musa alayhi salam. And the ayat are nearly identical. Let me read the ayah from Surah Yusuf for you. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ I'll translate the ayah for you. When he reached his mature age, when he reached his maturity, meaning teen years. Okay, so he's now answerable to Allah. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ Austin, cut it out, I'm getting distracted. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ Now you're famous on the internet, people know that you were distracting me. Okay. So, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ When he reached his mature years, آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا We gave him wisdom and knowledge. Now, this is important. Two things were given to Yusuf alayhi salam. When he reached teen years, he was given wisdom and knowledge. Usually we think of knowledge first and wisdom second. Especially for young people, they, get, they can learn knowledge, they can memorize a surah, they can sit in a class and take a test, they can get the knowledge, wisdom comes with age. Right? Everybody knows that. But Allah made use of special, before He mentioned His knowledge, He mentioned His wisdom, even in teenage years. And the teenage years for a young man, the last thing you think about is wisdom. For them making a wise choice about when to stop playing video games, or what food not to eat, or what friends not to hang out with, or what words not to use, or what... Every wise choice seems difficult, even if they're super smart in school. Right? So they can have knowledge, but they lack wisdom. That's just normal. Well, it comes with that age. But Yusuf was special. Allah gave him the ability to make wise decisions at an early age. 
in his teenage years. And on top of that, he made him extremely knowledgeable. Now, how is he knowledgeable? You see, he's a servant. But he's a servant of a governor, a minister. So when he's cleaning up the couch, the sofa, the governor is discussing economics and finance and politics and international relations. And he's discussing, you know, the, the market affairs and the housing affairs. And he's discussing all kinds of high level. I'm mean, such an attentive listener, he's getting a high quality education from one of the top intellectuals in the country just by being around, just by being in the room, you know, through osmosis. And so it's not just religious knowledge that he's receiving, he's understanding how the world works, how politics works, how society works. And he's got people, the, the minister has different guests coming, scholars are coming to him, you know, other, other ambassadors are coming to him, other dignitaries are coming to him. They're bringing things and discussing things from around the world. He's got an international education. He's the, literally being raised in the palace back in the day was living in the university. That's what that was. So Allah gave him wisdom and he also gave him profound knowledge. And then Allah says, these two gifts, وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ muhsinin. I put that here on top, is a muhsin. Muhsin means someone who excels. Allah says, and that is how we give reward to people who try to excel. This is Allah's way of saying, this wasn't just because for Yusuf, because he's a prophet. Allah says, any young man or woman for that matter, who tries to do their very best, Allah's gift for them in this life is going to be wisdom and knowledge. Allah will open up their mind to wisdom, give them the strength to make better choices, and Allah will open up their minds to be super smart. They'll gain, they'll gain a lot of knowledge. And this is Allah's reward for people who try to do their best, muhsineen, who keep Allah's presence before them. You know, I don't consider myself a muhsin by any stretch of the imagination. But I'll tell you one thing, I wasn't smart in college. I was not. I was struggling with, for me getting a B was like, like an Olympic gold medal. Like a B was awesome. I could not pay attention in classes. When I, when I would sit in a university classroom, you might as well release Novocaine directly on me because I was ugh. two minutes in. Give me two minutes, 120 seconds. I am out. I have students. My desk is touching the professor's desk, but it's accounting. What are you going to do? Two minutes in, I'm knocked out. And my professor is going, Mr. she's knocking on my desk. Mr. Khan, are you still with us? Mr. Khan, are you okay? And my friend who used to take all the classes with me, I hope he's watching, he's, Elvin, wake up tomorrow, wake up. That was me. And then at one point I decide I want to be the best I can in learning Allah's book. I want to do my very best in that. I just want to learn Allah's book. And I'm not a good student at anything at that point. I'm not. And I just told Allah, yeah, Allah just let me learn your book. Just, just let me learn it. And Allah opened the door to Arabic for me like I couldn't imagine. A couple of years later, and I'm not saying I'm some expert in Arabic. I've got a long way to go in my Arabic. But I would go meet with somebody and say, MashaAllah, Shaykh, where did you learn Arabic? I'm like, Shaykh, where did you learn? I'm like, uh, Queens, <laughs> Flushing. <laughs> what do you want me to tell you? You know, uh, how many hours did you spend? Uh, 20 minutes a night? Sorry, I can't give you a more impressive answer. <laughs> What Allah says is when people try to do their very best in something, then Allah opens up wisdom and knowledge for them. But coming back to the story, Yusuf السلام, was granted hukman wa ilman, and Allah says, wa kadalika nazil muhsinin. Now, the ayah again, I'll read the Arabic to you. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Exactly the same ayah in Surah Al-Qasas about Musa السلام, except one word is different. One word is added. Allah says, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ Just like that ayah. آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا Just like that ayah. وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Just like that ayah. But in the middle, Allah added, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَاسْتَوَى And He made him firm in strength. He made him like the bark of a tree. So Allah added this little information about Musa السلام, that he was made extremely strong. Now this is important, this is going to play a role. So they are very similar, except Yus Musa a.s. has this added feature that Allah mentioned, his unusual strength was added to the description of him as a young man. We know, because you guys have heard the story of Yusuf a.s. time and time again, what was, the, um, what was the great trial of Yusuf? Why did he get himself in so much trouble? Because he was really good looking. So you've got one young man who's exceptionally good-looking, and you've got the other young man who's exceptionally what? Strong. 
right? So, and in youth, those are the two things to aspire towards, right? So you've got looks and you've got strength. Not even now in high school, you've got pretty boys and you guys, boys that work out. They're not pretty, but they work out a lot. <laughs> right? So you've got looks or you've got strength. There's, there's guys that just work on their hair. That's good enough. That'll work for them. <laughs> or the brand of clothes. And other guys are benching whatever they can. Because they don't, they, they don't, Allah didn't give them the looks. So they might as well get the, yeah, <laughs> train themselves to be something. And, and be, be recognized for their strength. That's what's going to make them attractive. Now the thing is, looks can be a trial for a young man, and strength can be a trial for a young man. So for each of them, Yusuf salam was given a trial because of his looks. And Musa salam is given a trial because of his strength. Exactly, because the, the punch was strength, wasn't it? And that's where his trial begins. So now we move forward. When Allah described their teenage years, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَاسْتَوَىٰ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْلِ الْمُحْسِنِ This ayah that I'm citing to you from Qasas and without wastawa, without the extra strength in Yusuf a.s. story, in Surah Yusuf, immediately after the next ayah in Surah Al-Qasas about Musa, and immediately before that, the ayah right next to that in Surah Yusuf, the very next ayahs in both cases are their trial begins. So it's pretty interesting. Allah mentions their youth, and then He mentions trial. Right? And He didn't just mention youth. He said, their youth, they already had wisdom, they already had knowledge, and they were muhsineen. And many of you know the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about ihsan, people that are muhsineen, that you worship Allah as though you can see Him. And if you can, at least you're always aware that He's seeing you. That's muhsin. That's ihsan. Right? be a person of ihsan, you could have wisdom, you could have knowledge, and you'll still go through a trial. You'll still go through a trial. And there are both of them are going to get tried. And how are they going to get tried? Let's t- you guys know the story, so but I'm, I'm going to compare the elements of the story. Yusuf alayhi salam got tried in the bed having him clean the house or whatever, and they're secluded, it's just her and him. So his trial happens in seclusion, indoors. Musa alayhi salam is out in the afternoon in Egypt, and it's, it's their, their qaylula time. The Spanish call it siesta, the afternoon nap. Nowadays the entire world is in siesta, right? So it's understandable. So the streets are empty, and there's only two people in the street. One guy is killing the other. The Egyptian soldier is killing the Israelite. So, so one trial starts indoors, the other start, trial starts outdoors. Now you would imagine the one indoors is going to have privacy, and the one outdoors is exposed. But ironically, the one indoors obviously has privacy, and even the one outdoors has privacy, because nobody else is around, only two witnesses. Right? Only two people. Now, the trial of Yusuf salam happened from his, the owner of the house. She's his boss. She's the one who controls his life. She's the one who tells him what to do every single day. The minister, you can imagine, is out at work, out in the government office, out on an official trip. So who's home most of the time? 99% of the time. It's the queen, or it's the lady of the house, the minister's wife. And she's going to tell the servants what to do. Hurry up and go do this. Hurry up and go clean that. She's the one. And she has a boss role over Yusuf a.s. Because he's raised, he's come up those years just listening to tell her what to do. That's all he's ever done. Right? Because that's he's not a free person. He's a servant. So what I'm saying is the trial happened from someone who is of a higher position and has influence over you. Right? They already have an established influence over you. If you flip that equation, in case of Musa alayhi salam, Musa was royalty, right? Musa was raised in the palace. And the person who was getting beat up in the street was a slave of the, among the Israelites. So who's in the higher position now? Musa alayhi salam. So why is the, the person in a lower position a trial for him? The one that's in a lower position than you will try to appeal to you by making you feel sorry for them. And the one who is in a higher position to you can try you, put you in a trial by exerting their influence over you. Right? And so one of them is using their influence over you to put pressure on you. And the other one is using their pity card. I'm your brother. You're from one of us. Help your fellow brother. You're going to find yourself in either situation. 
in family, outside family, at work, at school, somewhere, there's somebody who's in a position of influence, and they are, have this hold over you, and because of them, they're making you succumb to something you don't want to do, or they're putting you in a fitna, they're putting you in a trial. And sometimes you're doing messed up things because you feel bad for somebody. Because you don't want them in pain, you don't want them suffering. And you're not even thinking that you might be doing something wrong. Because you feel so bad for them. So they're going to use that pity card on you to get their way. Right? So the, both of those trials are contrasted in the story of Yusuf and Musa alayhi Then she commands him to hurry. Hai talak. She says, I'll come back to that hurry up, but I want to just focus on the theme of hurrying here. Musa alayhi salam saw the man in trouble. He cried out for help. Istansarahu. Okay? So istaghathahu Musa. He called for Musa's help. Musa alayhi salam went immediately to help because he's not going to stand around and wait, right? Like, no, I'll think about it. Let me process this situation. No, he's going to jump in because he's like, he's going to kill him. He actually hurries up. So there's an element of hurrying up in the story of, of Musa alayhi salam. He hurries up, throws a punch in the middle of the skirmish, and the guy dies. And immediately, check this out, immediately Musa says, هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ shaytan. This is from the work of the devil. How is it from the work of the devil? You were helping a brother in distress. You were helping a fellow believer. Because he's a Muslim, he's an Israelite. You're, fel- you're helping a fellow believer. How is this the work of the devil? You know what it is? The Prophet ﷺ explains it. Al-ajilatu min shaytan Rushing is from the devil. Somebody asked for your help. You didn't analyze the whole situation. You didn't figure out what's what yet. You just jumped right in. You had good intention. You had good intention, but you rushed. Rushing into something without understanding all of the parameters is actually something that is from the work of the devil. The intention was not evil. The intention was actually good. But it's the, it's the rushing that was actually evil. And he basically makes the from that. So notice, one wants him to hurry out of evil intent, and the other one hurried out of good intent. But hurrying itself is a problem regardless. Hurrying to take action, analyze first, then take action. Sometimes the, the thing itself is an evil thing. You can see that, you run, like Yusuf salam runs. Other times what you're being called to might look like a good deed, but if it involves speaking out against somebody else, or harming somebody else, wait, hold on a second. I know you're saying this is a good thing, but let me just analyze for a second here. Let me take a step back before I raise my hand against someone else, or raise my tongue against someone else. Right? So don't rush to that, because you think you're doing some just cause. Because... Some could say, I've seen a thousand Israelite slaves get beat up by Egyptian soldiers. This is yet another case of the same thing that, that I see every day my whole life. And, and Allah is telling him, no, you can't confuse the other thousand cases you may have seen with this one case right now. You don't get to generalize. Like a judge doesn't get to generalize, oh man, I've seen a thousand divorce cases, I know what this one's about. You don't. And when a judge know what this is before he even hears the case because he's dealt with 40 other cases there lies a problem therein lies a problem we stop thinking that people come from a unique situation our messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam people came to him and they would say what's the best thing that i can do what's the best thing that i can do he could give them one answer somebody else came on another occasion what's the best thing that i can do he gave him a different answer man it's the same question islam is the same for everyone right so you should give everybody the same answer right but he gives different people different answers because he understands everyone's circumstance, everyone's trial, everyone's capability is different, and he, they need a different prescription. We don't do that. We say, oh, I'm... You know? And that was also a mistake on behalf of Musa Ali that he admitted to. I rushed to judgment. I rushed to judgment and therefore I rushed into action. So hurrying itself, rushing into things, with even good intent is what's being critiqued. And on the other hand, there may be people that want you to do evil, like the wife of the minister, wants you to do evil, and she, if you think about it, then you'll come to your senses. So before your brain calibrates and you realize how bad this is, stop, stop thinking about it. Just shut it off and hurry up. Right? And that be impulsive. And that's what she's counting on, that he hurries up. Because she knows how smart he is. If he gets a little bit of a chance to think, He's going he's gonna to slip. He's going to get away from me. Now, Yusuf, of course, is the trial of adultery. 
And Musa a.s. is the trial of what? Murder. It's remarkable that in the Quran, in two places, in Surah Al-Isra and then in Surah Al-Furqan. In Surah Al-Isra Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا And then He says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُ النَّفْسِ Okay? Uh, actually He says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُ النَّفْسِ وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا Flipped. He says, don't come near zina, don't kill a person. So they put them next to each other. In Surah Al-Furqan, He put them next to each other, but He flipped the order. لَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يزنون. They don't kill, they don't do zina. So one place He says, don't go near zina, don't kill. The other place He says, Allah slaves, don't, don't, do, don't kill and don't do zina. He flips the two. Okay? Now, why is that important? Because Allah is equating those two crimes. Those are the two major sins. Why are they equated in the spiritual world of Islam? One is the taking of a physical body physical life, and the other is killing someone spiritually. It's killing someone's iman, haya. The Prophet ﷺ says, if you don't have haya, do whatever you want. Right? That's, that's the ultimate crime, spiritually speaking. One is a crime, the greatest crime you can commit against another. The other is the greatest crime you can commit against yourself. They are equated. One is a crime against humanity, the other is actually a crime against Allah It's a crime against Allah. It's falling into the, the footsteps of shaitan. So this, these two are the great, the two major sins, and both of those prophets are tried with both of those major sins. So Yusuf alayhi salam would, uh, tried with adultery, and Musa alayhi salam tried with killing. Before anything could even happen, immediately, self protection. So he's not the. She says, "Hurry up!" He says, "I'll hurry up, all right. I'll hurry up and hold on to Allah." That's what he does. And he does this before anything can happen. With Musa alayhi salam, remember how he rushed? When he rushed, it's too late. He already threw a punch. It's already happened. He said, you know, هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ عَدُوٌ مُضِلٌ مُبِينٌ This is from the work of the devil. He's clearly an enemy, obviously. Rabbi, إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي فَاغْفِرْ لِي Master, I have done wrong to me. Please forgive me. What are we learning? What to do when you catch yourself heading towards haram, be like Yusuf. Just cling to Allah. Cling to Allah. You know, uh, uh, try this experiment. When you're getting towards the haram, just saying Allah's name. Just saying His name will put you to shame and you'll back off. Just saying His name out loud. Just saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem will put you to shame and it will guard you. But sometimes you forget to say it. Or, for, or sometimes we had good intention and we ended up doing something bad. And when that happens, be like Musa and immediately admit your mistake. Don't just blame the devil. Oh, shaitan made me do it. He's so bad. I'm gonna, I hate that guy. Yeah, you can hate him, but also you did wrong. So what did Musa do? He said it's the devil, but then he said, I wronged myself. He took responsibility. And he begged for forgiveness. So before, the, before what happens, you, you suffice some. After it may happen, Musa alayhi salam. Remarkable. Then Yusuf alayhi salam said, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Wrongdoers don't succeed. And Musa alayhi salam says, I have wronged myself. <laughs> Both of them mention ظَالِم. إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ رَبِّ إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي Yusuf alayhi salam even tries to appeal to the reason of the minister's wife and says, listen, my master has been good to me. Some of us say, here my master meaning Allah, which is acceptable tafsir. On the other hand, equally acceptable tafsir, my master, the one who gave me this house, who honored me to live here, whose house I've been serving, he's been good to me. How can I do that to his family? How can you ask me to be disloyal to my, my, the master who's taken care of me and been good to me? You know, in Rabbi ahsana mathwaya. On the other, so he's got a sense of loyalty to the one who took care of him, right? Both Allah Azza wa Jal and also the master of the house. On the other hand, Musa alayhi salam actually did have loyalty for the Israelites because he's also an Israelite and they're also fellow Muslims. They're believers. But once he realized his mistake, he helped a fellow brother and ended up following the trap of the shaitan. He stood against the kafir and stood next to his believing brother and ended up doing the wrong thing. So he says, I won't support in, you know, رَبِّي بِمَا أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيَّ فَلَنْ أَكُونَ ظَهِيرَ لِلْمُجْرِمِينَ I won't back up criminals ever again. It doesn't matter who belongs to my race and doesn't belong to my race, my loyalty will never be siding with criminals. In other words, we're learning, my master has done good to me, so I'm loyal to him. But even if my own people were doing bad, I won't be loyal to them. 
Loyalty does not come from just being from some people, you know. Now, you s the imagery contrast, Yusuf alayhi salam is running from her, away from her. And Musa alayhi salam rushed towards the aggressor <laughs> and, and, you know, hit one of the aggressors. This is also really interesting. Yusuf alayhi salam interpreted the speech. What do, what do I mean by that? Yusuf alayhi salam, when she said, hurry up, haytalak, what I'd like you to know is the words haytalak are not evil words. In Arabic, if you wanted to tell your servant to hurry up and feed the donkey, you'd say, hey talak, hurry up and do it. If you wanted him to clean the windows or do the, mop the floor, hey talak, hey talak, hey talak. He hears hey talak all the time. But in that particular moment, from her tone, her body language, the situation, he heard the same words, but he could tell she means something bad right now. This is not the haytalak I heard my whole life. I'm able to interpret the difference between this and all the other haytalaks I've heard. I'm going to make a run for it. This is someone who's never run away from the instruction of their boss. No. Right? Because he can interpret what's behind that speech. What's behind it. Musa alayhi salam hears, on the contrast, he hears an Israelite taking a beating on the ground. And he's asking for his brother's help. He's not able to interpret what's going on behind it. This, is, this kid, this guy's a scam artist. He's a con artist. He's getting beat up because he asked for it. He committed some kind of crime. But Musa Ali Sam can't see that far. He's impulsively responding. Right? So he, what you see is a contrast in Yusuf. Now we see what the, the two strengths are. Actually, it's not just Yusuf Ali Sam had great looks. His strength is his ability to interpret speech. Just like he interprets dreams. Right? He can interpret all kinds of speech. يُعَلِّمُكَ مِن تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَدِيثِ Yaqub told him, Allah is teaching you the way to interpret all kinds of speech, not just dreams. All kinds of speech. So he was able to do that. Musa a.s. doesn't have that special skill yet. So he wasn't able to interpret the speech of that con artist. I'm gonna, because I don't want to go over an hour, your attention span will die. So inshallah I'll continue this tomorrow. I'll go up to 14 and continue tomorrow inshallah. But... Um, so Yusuf alayhi salam is loyal to the master of the house. But by flip contrast, Musa alayhi salam is loyal to the slaves, meaning the Israelites. Actually, it's his loyalty that led him to do, the, to rush to help. Because any, the reason he used to go out in the middle of the afternoon into the middle of the city square where nobody was there is because he knew he's an Israelite and that's the time when even the police takes a break so he could go into, into Egypt and he could help the Israelite poor, the sick, or the laborers who couldn't finish their work. He could finish their work for them because he was loyal to them and not get caught. Because if Egyptian royalty gets caught doing slave work, he's going to get in trouble. He wants to volunteer and help his people, but he can't do that publicly, right? So he used to leave his palace in the middle of the afternoon when everybody's taking a nap just for the intention of going and helping his people. So Yusuf alayhi salam is serving the master and Musa alayhi salam is serving the slaves. That's the, the contrast between the two. So inshallah ta'ala from here to, uh, to the rest of them, I think I collected 29 of these comparisons. So we're halfway or a little less than halfway through. But inshallah I'll continue this tomorrow and finish up the rest of the comparisons also. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you guys are enjoying this series.